Proverbs chapter number 16 this morning. I dare say my favorite book of the Bible. Why? Because I could sit down and chew on it for a little bit. Think. So much truth and wisdom that God inspired Solomon to pin down that God had blessed Solomon with. That is just as true today as it is when it was pinned down. I mean, Ecclesiastes, Solomon wrote nothing new under the sun. And if it's true back then, it's still true today. And in Proverbs chapter number 16, verse number 5, I'm sorry, verse number 6. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the opportunity you've given us to come to your house this morning. Lord, we're thankful for what the weekend represents, Lord, that uh, we take time to honor those that have uh, done and labored to make our country, make our communities what it is. But Lord, every Sunday we come, Lord, uh, notice and take note and worship the labor that your son did on the cross of Calvary. Lord, that uh, each and every day, Lord, that uh, <laughs> without you we're not much. Lord, without your touch we wouldn't be able to do anything. Lord, I pray that you just use your unworthy servant this morning, Lord, and hedge me, my mind in, Lord, put a bridle about my tongue. Lord, I pray that you'd help your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we only read one verse, and that's the reason. If we'd read two, we'd have been here for three hours. So, one verse, but in this verse, I notice two things that we have to get addressed in the introduction. First, we notice iniquity, but then in the second part of the verse, we notice evil. What's that? Sin. Sin and iniquity are the two biggest problems that anybody's ever going to have in their life. One will cause them to die and go to hell. The other will cause the riches and the blessings of God to be withheld from their life. But there's a difference between sin and iniquity. Sin is the transgression of God's law. God's law, if we were to go back and to bring out each and every one of them, over 600 different laws, we're guilty of almost every single one of them right now. But if you were guilty in one part of the law, you were guilty of the whole law, the Bible teaches us. So sin, even though it may be the you know, most insignificant of sins, according to God, if you're guilty in part, you're guilty of all. Sin, being the transgression of the law, can also be hereditary. The Bible tells us that by one man, sin entered into the world. Death by sin, and so death passed upon every man. Even though the act may not be hereditary, thankfully we don't hold any, <laughs> any longer, the court can't convict me for something that my father did. But the effects of sin certainly are hereditary. Because of one man, all mankind was doomed to be dead spiritually. Where once our soul was given by the very breath of God, Genesis tells us, that God breathed into man... And he became a living soul. Not only were we God formed, we were God breathed. And our existence was for one thing and one thing alone. To have fellowship and to worship God freely. That God wanted someone not just to worship him because that's what the angels were created to do. But because they chose to worship God. Dare I say to be friends of God. Do not God walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. Even we find that God spoke to Moses through the pillar of the cloud in the wilderness face to face as a friend. All that God has desired is the relationship, with me, but because of sin, we became dead spiritually. God cannot have any dealing with unholy things. Sin is a condition, not just an act. Sin is what will cause you to die and go to hell, but sin is what causes your life to be dead. We sin by making a choice, but sin is a state of being. Sin is a lack of light. It's blindness. The Bible says that before people are saved, they are groping in the darkness. Sin, just like being blind, you can't help yourself. If you are blind, if, unless you're very familiar with the area, you're stumbling and bumping into things very often. Even if you know where you're at. Like, for instance, some of us, during a power outage, we find out how little we know our house's layout. Even though you're familiar, with, it's very easy to become disoriented. 
Sin puts the blinders on your eyes to where you don't see things as they really are, and all you're trying to do is get from point A to point B without bumping into as much as you can. Blindness will keep things centered on you, what you can see, what you can or what you can't see, what you can hear, what you can smell, what you can feel. But if the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. You learn that it's not about what you are going through, it's about him. We'll get to that here in a second. But see, iniquity is a whole different animal. Iniquity is unequal dealing with God. Certainly a sinner can sin. But see, sinners also commit iniquity, but saved people can commit iniquity. Just like saved people can still commit a sin. Iniquity is not giving God what God deserves. But what do you give God, the creator of the universe, right? The one who said, let there be light, and there was light. The one who purposed that the water and the firmament be separated, and it just happened. Right? The one that made all the plants, and then in one day, they all grew. Right? Explain that one, Home Depot. Right? Didn't need no miracle grow there. Just says that he made it, and is there. Right, the one that took nothing and made everything. What's he deserve? Everything. But God doesn't expect everything. He expects our best. Because he's an all-knowing God, he knows I'm not perfect. He knows I'm God. I just sang about it. There are days I fail him. In fact, not just days, more days than not days. Right? There's a good chance that if, not a betting man, but if I was, I'd put money on, I'm failing the grace of God today. Why? Because the only person that can meet that expectation is Christ. But iniquity is not holding back everything from God. Iniquity is just not giving Him your best. He doesn't expect everything. He just expects what He gave, which was His only begotten Son, His best. When we know that we ought to devote time to God and we don't, iniquity. Whether you understand it or not, if you don't give God your best, you commit iniquity. That's why a lost person can still commit iniquity. Because the Bible says that man's without excuse not to know that there is a God and that He's worthy of worship. That we can look at everything that He made and realize nothing out there made anything else. Right? The rock didn't make the grass and the grass didn't make the tree. It took a divine hand to make what we see in the world. We know that there's a God. And we ought to know that He's worthy of praise, even if we never heard it. So if we don't give God our best, we're guilty of a negative, whether we're lost or we're saved. Now that's the rough part. But see, we also see in this verse, not only sin and iniquity, we see the remedy. See, God being God didn't leave us to our own devices. The Bible says that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He knew that man would fail him, and as a result, he made a way to redeem man before he ever made man. But there are some ingredients that are necessary in order for somebody to have sin or iniquity resolved in their life. They're the same. Doesn't matter if you're you know, white, black, brown, blue, purple, orange. Right, if you've been to the tanning bed too many times or spray tan booth too many times. Regardless what color you are, what creed you are, regardless what background you came from, regardless of who gave you the gospel, the good news, the process is the same for everybody. But for sin and iniquity, there's two different recipes. But how are we cleansed of sin? Well, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 tells me that for by grace are you saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. Well, the remedy for sin to be removed or remedied, right, we talked about it a little bit in Sunday school, atoned. That means removed. Done away with. Never existed. It's grace and it's faith. Well, the grace comes from God. Faith also comes from God. 
The Bible tells us that God gave man, every man a measure of faith. You know what that measure means? Everybody got the same amount. Right. He used the same instrument to give to you faith that he did to give to me faith. You know how I know that? The Bible says God's no respecter of persons. He doesn't hold anybody else in higher favor than anybody else. So that little bit of faith that God put in me and His grace. Now, see, now we got to define another thing. Teens, you're lucky today. In teens class, I make them define the words. But today I'm doing the work for you. So y'all just be happy that it's not teens class. Or I'd be pointing at people and saying, what's that mean? Grace. As an acronym, some people said it's God's riches at Christ's expense. Because of what Christ did, now we can have the riches of God. But grace is more than that. See, grace is giving what is not earned or deserved. Grace is purposefully doing good to someone that's not worthy of it. Grace is looking at something that says, there's nothing good about it, but I want to be good to it. True grace is given not out of pity, not out of empathy, not out of sympathy, but out of love. True grace expects nothing in return, but does because of the need. Not because of who the person receiving it is, but because of what they're facing. Truly, for us to be saved from sin, it took a holy, just, righteous God to have compassion on us. But you could have compassion, but not take action. God cared so much that He purposefully intervened in your life. Not just 2,000 years ago when He sent His only begotten Son to die upon the cross like we sang about in the second choir song. It's all because of God's amazing grace that we'll make it. But we made it because of all that Christ did to remove those things which are in our way. Sin was too great for us. Sin was stronger than us. Sin could hold us longer than we wanted to be there. Could cause us to pay more than we were willing to pay. And eventually would have dragged us off into hell. Sin was more than we could handle. So God had to handle it. And then after He did it all, He said, just to make sure that they all have what it takes, He gave us all the faith on top. That's a whole different message. But just talking about God's goodness towards a sinful, lost, unjust, filthy, vile, no good, th in the muck and the mire, the Bible says. The miry clay. Then He came to us to give it to us. Then He brought us out and changed us. But when we see not just what it took to take it away, sin, evil, it says that the fear of the Lord, in the latter part of our verse, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Once you realize how good God's been to you and you truly begin to reverence Him in your life, that love, that reverence, that appreciation will cause you to change the way that you act. Not because you're afraid that God will punish you, but because you're afraid of disappointing what God put into you. God put him very, His self, His very self, in every believer. The Holy Spirit. And by that Spirit, He said that He would lead and guide us into all truth. Which gets us on to iniquity. We also find the recipe for the removal of iniquity. Beginning part of the verse, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. You know what purged means? Removed. Same thing that we were talking about before. If you purge something, right, in computer terms, you're going to make it look like it's never there. That you're completely cleaning it out. No trace left behind starting over new. All that code that used to be there, it's a blank slate now. You can put whatever you want to in there. But iniquity, that unequal dealing that we were talking about, the recipe to have iniquity removed is mercy and truth. Again, mercy. That's not giving us what we deserve. 
Bible tells me that God's angry with the wicked every day. The only thing that holds back God's fierce judgment upon the world is God's mercy. I mean, it's one thing to talk about how great God is because of the things that He does for us, even though we don't deserve it. But how often do we forget about the things that God holds back from us that we do deserve? That's mercy. People like to lump them together, two different things. Now see, iniquity, again, that's me not dealing with God the way that God deserves to be dealt with. That is, as the supreme and eminent thing in my life. He should be first in my desires, first in my decisions, first in my conscience, first in my actions. Everything should be devoted to Him. That's what He deserves. Well, He deserves more than that, but that's what He expects. And truly, it's not that hard. But see, when iniquity is committed, iniquity is a product of falsehood. That's why it takes truth to resolve it. Iniquity can only exist when you don't know the whole truth or when you're willing to deceive yourself or be deceived and someone tells you a lie. Because the truth is, is that God is great, God is good, and God deserves to be first in my life. So in order for that to not be true, I have to believe a lie. I have to be ignorant of the truth. Or somebody has to deceive me. The Bible tells nature itself points to the fact that God is deserving of my praise. I'm without excuse regardless. But all the truth will tell me is that He is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb, and to God be the glory. Right? He's worthy of every second of my life. If I could devote it in praise unto Him, He's worthy. But He didn't ask for that. He asked me to live for Him. But see, iniquity is a result of a lie. Not having the truth. Well, truth takes one form. The Word of God. Truth will show us the error of our ways. I'm not going to make excuses for anybody, but we're all wrong. At some point, we're all wrong. At some point, we've either let ourselves believe something that's not true, we've bought into something that society or that the world or maybe somebody in the church house told you, and it's not the truth. It's going to happen. Your flesh wants to be deceived, so it can go back to being you know, blissful and ignorance. Before you got saved, your flesh didn't realize that what it was doing was wrong. It's just doing what came natural to it. Well, afterwards, God deserves for our life to be a holy representation of Him. To be Christ-like. And when we're not, it's iniquity. Because Christ overcame for my sake, I should overcome for His sake. But see, we can tell ourselves that, oh, well, I don't have to do that today. Well, what changed between today and yesterday? God did. When did it be, uh, become okay to do this when for years you never did it? Something had to change. What was it? What you thought was true. Iniquity is the result of either the truth being snuffed out the truth not being taught or you just not listening to it. But if you listen to the truth, the truth will show us that we're wrong. It's one of the beautiful things about the Holy Ghost is conviction. That word just means convincing. Conviction's a whole lot less painful if we just admit we're wrong. When He doesn't have to twist His heart to show us that we are wrong, to convince us conviction is not that bad but that conviction is us accepting the truth rejecting what we thought was true and embracing God's truth the only truth but see iniquity doesn't just take truth it takes mercy there's a time back when my brother was in peewee football 
I was in high school. I'd help out every now and then on their football team. You can tell when somebody's not giving it their all. And there was something about me that wanted to go over and kick the ones that were, <laughs> and they're walking. I'm like, you think that's running? I want to make you run. And if you slow down, I want to kick you. I didn't do it, but I wanted to. What are you saying? If we can notice, not just in silly things like sports, you can look in somebody's life and tell whether or not they're giving it their all. How much more if man looks upon the outward experience or outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart, how much more can God see when we're not giving it our all? And in that moment, what we're deserving of is to be wiped off the face of the earth, cast into hell for things we've done after we've been saved, but yet God withholds it because of mercy. Iniquity can never be resolved unless there's an opportunity to get it made right. That's why you can preach truth all you want to, but without mercy, iniquity won't be resolved. Now see, you can punish iniquity, but in punishment doesn't purge. Our verse says that it, by mercy and truth, iniquity is per removed, taken away, it's resolved. It's not there anymore. In order for that to happen, somebody has to admit that they were wrong. Somebody has to get made right. But if God were to give us what we deserve when we deserved it, the iniquity would still be there. God wants to give us a chance to have it resolved. Now, can we undo what we did? No, but we can remove it from in the way. Punishment does not bring about a purge. In fact, if you punish something, there will always be a record of what was requiring the punishment. But if you get it made right, things can be made whole. That's why mercy is such an integral part of iniquity being resolved. So with the Lord's help, we're going to preach on this morning mercy and truth. Mercy and truth. Are we not called to take on the attributes of our Father? Did He not promise that if any man come unto Him, He no wise cast him out, and that if any man come to Him, He'd make him into a new creature? That new creature has attributes of our Father. So how many Christians today would we say are full of mercy and truth? How many Christians today would we say are pillars or are branches of God's mercy? Are conduits of God's truth in the community? Because in order to have things purged, there must be mercy and there must be truth. A lot of people are willing to get up and preach the Word of God and God's judgment, they're willing to tell you all the ways that you're wrong and all the reasons that you deserve to be treated the way that you're being treated, but they don't want to tell a lot about mercy. People like grace, because grace got rid of our sin, but we don't want to think about mercy, because if we start talking about mercy, then we have to deal with our own iniquity. We're willing to talk about grace and how God loves us, but because of God's mercy, we lived long enough to hear about God's grace. Because of God's mercy, there was a time in your life where you heard about the gospel, and God didn't just kill you when you were conceived, wipe your soul off of the mat before you were born, and say, because of what I made, because you have life, your very soul knows that I'm God. What's your excuse for not worshiping, for not living a sinless, perfect life? They didn't do that. Why? Because of mercy. Without mercy, no grace can ever be shown. Without mercy, love can never be bestowed. Without mercy, there won't be the footsteps to go and tell, to go and give, to go and show what somebody needs. So how come... Today, modern day Christianity, the reputation is, is that churches eat their own. 
You don't want to hang out with the Baptists. They'll cut you down. You don't want to hang out with this crowd or that crowd because I was a part of one of them and they did me wrong. Sometimes people even say, even though I deserved it, I expected better from God's people. The indictment is not that we don't appreciate grace. The indictment is that Christ being merciful, everybody that came to Christ, He didn't cast them out. Didn't matter who they were, where they came from, what they deserved. In fact, he went to those that other people wouldn't even consider going to. That woman at the well, everybody in her community, they had pretended that she doesn't exist anymore. They cast her out. That's what outcast meant. She wasn't a part of society anymore. Everybody just agreed one day, because of what she's done, we're going to pretend she doesn't exist anymore. Not going to trade with her. Not going to have her over for dinner. Not going to talk to her. In our eyes, she doesn't exist anymore. And let's be honest, she deserved it. Under the law, that's what she deserved and more. But Jesus, in mercy, he was sitting at the well waiting on her. He sought her out. You know why he sought her out? Because long before he ever showed her grace, he had already blanketed her with mercy. Well, we as Christians will never be effective witnesses or effective conduits of God's grace if we don't first embrace mercy. It's very easy to say, well, they deserve it. Yeah, I deserved worse. He said, what do you deserve? Hell. Well, you don't know what they did to me. No, but I know what I did to Jesus. My sin hung him on the cross. My sin caused his body to be marred to the point where he didn't even look human anymore. Yet he still showed me mercy. Well, you don't know where they come from. I know where I came from. Where's that? The darkest pit. Full of sin, full of wickedness, but yet Christ came to me and brought me out. Mercy is what puts footsteps, puts action into what's really in our heart. You can have all the sympathy and empathy that you want, but it's never going to change anything unless you start showing mercy. Mercy says, Grace would say, well, I want to give them this, but I don't know anybody that can go to them. I want to be good to that person, but I just don't know how to show. Mercy resolves all those excuses. Mercy says, doesn't matter how I have to get it there, I'm going to get it there because I want to be good to this person. Mercy truly is what removes the obstacles from you being good to other people. Without mercy, you know what it is? It's prideful. They're too low. They don't deserve. Well, who am I to cast? All judgment's been committed unto Jesus, and I find that he tells us that we are to go. How can we go unless we have mercy? And what are we supposed to take with us when we go? The truth. We'll get to that here in a second. But true mercy, being a part of a Christian's life, is not only necessary, it's vital. Without mercy, you don't tell people what they need, you tell them what they deserve. Without mercy, you don't tell people how things can be better, you tell them how they're only going to get worse. Without mercy, you're not willing to extend a hand in help, but instead you'll withdraw your hand and say, I don't want anything to do with you. Mercy puts on blinders to where we don't see what the person is. We don't see them. We don't see what they've done. Don't see where they're at. Mercy causes you to see what people need. Mercy causes you to say, I don't care about anything else. Now, let's be honest. Doctors don't reject people at the door. I don't like that person. Take them out. They wheel you into an ER. Somebody's going to look at you.
right? If your house was on fire and you called the fire department, we're not going to that address. You don't know what they did to me. Sometimes mercy's just inherent. But other times you have to choose to be merciful. We would all say that, well, if somebody's on fire, certainly we'd pour water on them. If somebody needed help, if they fell down and we were there, of course we'd help them up. Well, do they deserve to be helped up? Nobody stops and asks that question. Well, did they deserve to fall over? Well, that person dropped whatever they tripped on. They should be the one to help pick them up. We don't do that. So why in the world when it comes to the things of God would we say, well, you don't know what they... It's the greatest need they have in their life. If they die without God, they'll go to hell. And yet we stand back and we withdraw mercy. Why? Because of the feelings of the flesh. But see, then there's truth. Because mercy just keeps somebody from getting what they deserve. But truth, that's what sets somebody free. Truth being a light that can open their blinded eyes. All the problems of sin, truth can resolve. So long as somebody goes. Well, we've already decided that they won't go without truth. I mean, without mercy. But if they have mercy and they go with anything other than, than truth, it's not going to work. Truly. Truly. What is truth? Something that's unrefutable. It's proven. It's been shown to be faithful. That it's not something that was conjured up it's actual fact. That truth is real. Not fiction, not fantasy. It's real. You can take it to the bank. Check's going to clear. That's truth. So why, even though people can be filled with mercy, they want to go and they want to help somebody, why would you ever give them anything else than what God said on the matter? I don't care about so-and-so's new book that came out. What I care about is what God says. Why would I want to get somebody to an AA meeting before I got them to Jesus? Why would I want to get somebody checked into rehab before they've heard about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? The one that can solve their true problem. If we have such mercy on others, will we take the truth to them in full rather than in part we like to talk about what God's done for us when was the last time you told somebody what God could do for them when was the last time that we said hey you look like you're having a bad day I just want to pick up your spirits just want to let you know everything's okay in heaven today he said well how in the world can you you don't know what I'm going through. No, but I know what I was going through. I know what came by my way. I know what shipwreck God found me in. And I promise you this, is just as bad as whatever's going on in your life. And if he could do it for me, he could do it for you. And what we don't understand is all of what I just said, even though it may not have been verbatim, it is line upon line what the Word of God says. That my life was shipwrecked. But yet there was a captain that came by on the old ship of Zion, threw out a lifeline to me one day and said, come on board. You know what brought that ship by my way? Men of God that stood up and preached truth. In my life as a mom and dad that instilled truth rather than opinions, rather than what the school district or the college board or whatever... The Homeowners Association, them things are a mess. <laughs> Regardless of what man said on the issue, they just stuck with truth. So why would you take your opinion? Why would you take anything other than truth? Truth can be proven. Why do you think that the 
God prophesied that His Word would be refined in silver tried to, seven times. It had been tried and it came out true each and every time. But so why would we go with what we think on the issue rather than what we know God's done and proven in the past? It's truth. You never have to apologize for truth. You never have to recant truth. You never have to revise the truth. You never have to recall what you told this person and what you told that person if you tell them the same thing. But see, truly, if we're talking about us, in order for iniquity to be purged, truth has to be received. Truth will cause change if it's applied. Truth will change you. Truth will change others. Because truth, really, being the Word of God, well, John 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus was the Word, capital W. So really, all this is is a testament of all that Christ is and all that Christ did. To receive truth is to receive Christ. And to receive Him, that voluntary action, it'll change you. It'll change what you do. It'll change how you do it. And it will change the priorities of things in your life in what order you do them. But see, how can you give truth to somebody else unless you've applied that truth already? The Bible says we're written epistles known and read of all men. Well, how much truth's in your book? I can't give you what you need that will help you, what will change your life unless I've received that previously. Until it becomes a part of me, I can't give it to somebody else. I can tell you where to go find it, but what good is that going to do for anybody? I mean, think of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, two people walk by this guy. He's dying on the side of the road. The law passed him by. The religious man passed him by. Neither one of them did anything for him. Right? If I get shot today, God can heal me. No problem. But in the meantime, call an ambulance. God can if He wants to, but I'm not an idiot. God gave me a doctor. Okay, truth, right, as much as I want to, you can pass somebody on the side. I'll pray for you. But what if God wanted you to help him? Well, I don't have what you need, but I'm going to call the guy that needs to come and talk to you. Since when is the pastor the sole ambassador of truth in a community? Used to, God's people had enough truth in them that they could help somebody. Used to, they had hid the Word of God in their heart, not just that they might not sin against, them, sin against Him, but so that they could take that truth and give it to others that needed it. I mean, let's be honest. There's a whole group out there that have given people that walk around with supposed Bibles up underneath their hand and walk around all the time. They get, usually got white shirts on, black ties, and they ride bicycles. Right? If you started dressing like that, people would associate you with them. Okay? You'd be weird in their eyes. People, because of the way society is, they see anybody like this, they don't want what you have already. They want truth. They don't realize that my... Mine's the only one that's got truth in it. They don't realize that. They just see that, oh, he's one of them. True impact doesn't come from people that go knocking and just spit off a bunch of verses at people. It comes from those that have applied this, have had God, you know, prove it to them through wisdom, through experience, and then they give that truth back. The Good Samaritan didn't say, well, I'll pray that God helps you out. The Good Samaritan didn't say, well, brother, you may have deserved this. But even though you deserved it, I'll help you a little. No. 
He didn't just bind up his wounds. He poured oil. He disinfected. Right? He took out everything that shouldn't have been in there and bound up everything that should have been in there. Then he didn't leave them there. He took them to the place that he could recover. Fortunately, after his surgery, they didn't just roll them out on the road. Like, well, you're done. Here you go. No, they ensured that there was a place that the change could take hold. Are we not instructed by Christ that He has a feast as a master? And those that were closest to the master rejected the master. So He said, go get the ones that are out in the highways and hedges. It takes mercy to go hiking down a highway at nighttime. It takes mercy to start crawling through the hedges, digging through bushes, looking for people that have lost their home, lost their family, lost everything, and they're living in a ditch on the side of the road. It takes mercy, but what are you going to do when you get there if you don't have any truth? He said, go and tell them, come and dine at the Master's house. There's a full spread that He laid out. You don't need to bring anything. He's got everything for you. And if He does for you what He did for me, He's going to give you a new robe. You're not going to have to worry about coming before Him and not being presentable. He's got His own robe that He's going to put on you. He'll give you a ring. He'll give you a seat. And He'll call you one of His own. But how many of us this week had enough mercy that we went digging through hedges? How many of us took truth to those that were down the highway? You know what? The highway represents those that are just passing by. Those that had not entertained, didn't even know that the Master lived over here, didn't know nothing about this area. They're trying to get from A to B. There's a whole bunch of people that are just going from A to B. A being where they were born, B being hell. They're just traveling the highway that's going to take them to damnation. But yet we're instructed to go out and to bring them to the Master's house. Then there's the hedges. That's those that are ensnared, that are trapped. They may know that they're wrong, but they don't know how to get out of their situation. Are you willing to dig through some of the trouble that that person got their life into so that you can take them the truth? Are you willing to ruin your appearance to get to somebody that needs help? Instead of caring what people think about you, are you more concerned with what somebody needs? Truth and mercy, if it's made an impact on you, you'll want to use them to make an impact on others. But see, you can't be merciful unless you realize that you do deserve a whole lot worse. Somewhere along the line, we brainwashed ourselves into thinking that this is the life that God wanted us to have, and it was always intended to be this way. He knew exactly what was going to happen. God's all knowing. He knew what was going to happen. But God also knew what was going to happen if you didn't hear about Jesus. You know what? You deserved the fiery wrath of a thrice angry and thrice holy God. You know what you deserve? Not just hell, but to be cast into the lake of fire which consumes hell. We deserved it, but we didn't get it. We received Christ because of grace and because of faith. But grace never would have come down the road if mercy and truth hadn't come right before it. We like to talk about grace. We like to claim that we have the truth. Well, how many people have we shown it to? We like to smite our chest and say, look at what we've got. But nowhere in a Christian's life do I see where we're supposed to brag about what we have. We're supposed to give to others what God's given unto us. The difference is, is that one doesn't have mercy. Even though they've got grace. Even though they've got truth. But then the other, you may look at them and say, in fact, I'm going to read you this verse. Just a few verses later in chapter number 16. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. You may look at some and say, wow, God's really blessed them. You know who that is most of the time? Most of the time. 
If they're more concerned about what they have, those things usually have them. Those that you may look at and say, well, there's not much to them. Well, maybe not on the outside, but they've got righteousness and they've got right. They got right with God and started showing mercy and truth to others. Maybe they don't have as much because they give a whole lot more of themselves. Maybe you look at them and they got bags under their eyes and they got a whole bunch of wrinkles and a whole lot of gray hair. And you'd say, that person looks terrible. Well, maybe it's because they're so concerned about others that they're praying that God would open up a door so that in mercy they could take truth to them. They labor at the altar praying that God would give them an opportunity to go to a hedge or to travel down a highway and bring somebody back to the master's house. You may be able to fool others into thinking that you're something special. But without mercy, without love, or as charity, as the Apostle Paul wrote, everything we do, sounding brass, tinkling cymbals, you know what that means? Worthless. And if we test out worthless, the consequence, God's people, He'll stamp Ichabod above a door and He'll depart. He'll let us do it our way. But His way is a whole lot easier. What is it? Mercy, truth, and grace. He took care of everything else. He could have made us obsolete and Christ still be walking the earth today. But He chose that people would win other people. Without mercy, we don't accomplish the very goal that God has for our life. Regardless of the outcome. Doesn't matter how many come or don't come, mercy has to be there for me to go. That's it. Sister Renee, if you would, come play the piano. But Clint, come get a song invitation. Be honest with you, I don't know what y'all been through this week. Don't know what you faced. Don't know how you were tried, tempted. But I do know that Jesus is enough. You know how I found that out? Because in mercy, somebody told me about him one day. Let's all stand. As these are coming, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you again for the opportunity to come to your house today. Lord, I pray that you'd head this, hedge this sanctuary in. Lord, that you keep distractions and temptations out of your sanctuary as people do business with God. Lord, I pray that the sweet Holy Ghost be able to move freely and to do his business, his handiwork. And Lord, I pray that you'd get all the praise, honor, and glory for everything done. In Jesus' name we pray. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.